Monster Hunter Wilds is going to be huge. Bigger than I thought it was going to be. Bigger than many people probably thought it was going to be. That's a lie. I totally knew it was going to be this big to begin with. And I'm not talking about in a game sense. Though it's definitely going to be big there too. I'm talking about it as a success. I think that Monster Hunter Wilds is going to be a cultural phenomenon that's going to sweep 2025. That's for a multitude of reasons that I don't think anybody's really paying attention to. Nor are they even aware of in the first place. So today what I want to do is I want to look into the past to see the future. I want to see how the series has evolved over time, talk about that, and then reflect on the things that are changing with Monster Hunter Wilds and see why this game is going to be a major contender even in the same year that we're going to be seeing a new Grand Theft Auto. The Monster Hunter franchise began its journey in 2004 with the release of the original Monster Hunter on PlayStation 2. Developed and published by Capcom, this action role-playing game introduced players to a world in which they would take on the role as a hunter, tasked with slaying and capturing massive, fantastical creatures. Monster Hunter as a series was inspired by things like Indiana Jones, Dragonlance, Lord of the Rings, a few Studio Ghibli films, as well as some areas that were showcased in National Geographic. For the monsters themselves, Jurassic Park was one of the biggest inspirations, as well as real-life animals that the creators had met throughout their journey of inspiration. Inspiration for armors were taken straight from Conan the Barbarian and Berserk, as well as a lot of real-life armors, outfits, weaponry, and traditional cultural outfits as well. Despite its innovative gameplay and unique premise, the first Monster Hunter really struggled to find any significant foothold outside of Japan. The game's steep learning curve, reliance on multiplayer cooperation, and a lack of compelling single-player experiences were seen as a barrier to entry for Western audiences. However, in Japan, it quickly developed a cult following, with players being drawn to its complex mechanics and the thrill of cooperative hunting. The success of the original game in Japan led to the development of several sequels and spin-offs, each refining and expanding upon the core gameplay experience that players had fallen in love with. Monster Hunter Freedom released in 2005 on the PSP, and it played a crucial role in popularizing the game in Japan. The portable nature of the PSP allowed for local multiplayer sessions, which ended up becoming a cultural phenomenon and popularized the game among Japanese students. As the series progressed, Capcom continued to innovate and improve, introducing new features such as weapon classes, more intricate environments, and of course, new monsters. Titles like Monster Hunter Freedom Unite and Monster Hunter Try began to garner more attention and critical acclaim in the West, laying the groundwork for the franchise's eventual global breakout. I think it's important to keep in mind that not every video game series or popular video game series started off with a bang. Many of them grew slowly but surely, and that's exactly what ended up happening with Monster Hunter. They had this dedicated fan base in Japan. They built and reiterated on the things that made the game special and made players want to play it. And then what they ended up doing is realizing that they had certain limitations in place that were keeping them from being able to reach a broader audience, a wider audience, or a global market. And they just refined that process to the point where they could one day capture the attention of gamers worldwide. And that's exactly what they did. The release of Monster Hunter World in January of 2018 marked a pivotal moment for the Monster Hunter franchise. It was a game changer that propelled the series from a niche favorite into a mainstream phenomenon. Monster Hunter World was the first game in the series to be developed for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and then later the PC, taking full advantage of advanced hardware capabilities at the time to deliver a stunning and immersive experience that was impossible to ignore. One of the key factors behind Monster Hunter World's breakthrough success was its accessibility. Capcom made significant efforts to lower the barrier of entry for new players without sacrificing the depth and complexity that longtime fans had cherished. Tutorials became more comprehensive, user interfaces were more streamlined, though, to be honest with you, they're still relatively complicated in my opinion, but the quality of life improvements that were introduced into the game made it more approachable. This includes changes like more intuitive controls, better map navigation, and a smoother learning curve for mastering the game's numerous systems. The open world design was another major innovation. Unlike previous titles that were segmented into smaller zones with loading screens, Monster Hunter World leaned into its name, featuring these expansive, interconnected environments that were teeming with life. They wanted to make real ecosystems. This seamlessness would allow a more dynamic and fluid gameplay experience where players could track and hunt monsters across richly detailed biomes. The environments felt alive, with ecosystems and wildlife that interacted in believable ways, adding a layer of realism and immersion that was previously not in these titles. Yuya Takoda, the director of Monster Hunter World, emphasized that fluidity in a lecture after the game's release, saying, 
When designing monsters, creating a solid ecosystem with the right food chain was the first step. If there is an herbivore in the field, a relatively weak monster that preys on herbivores should be in that same field, and there should be an even stronger predator as well. Starting with small insects, herbivores, the great jagras, the anginath, all live in the ancient forest, and the rathalos is at the top of that food chain. The map had to be designed again to match that ecosystem. The outer part of the island, where weak monsters live, consists of plains and prairies. As you go deep into the island, where stronger monsters live, the island is packed with tropical forests and huge trees. Monster Hunter World also placed a greater emphasis on story and narrative elements. While earlier games had minimal plot, World introduced a compelling storyline that guided players through their progression as a hunter. This story, combined with memorable characters and cinematic cutscenes, helped to engage players on a fundamental level, providing context and motivation for their hunts. When you're reaching a wider audience, they want a reason behind what they are doing rather than just playing a game. Multiplayer functionality was also vastly improved, making it easier to join hunts with friends or just with random people online. The game's SOS flare system allowed players to call for help during hunts, encouraging cooperative gameplay and fostering a strong online community. Players like to go and help other players. They feel like the hero when they're coming in to save someone when they're having a hard time. This is something that we've seen with Helldivers 2. This emphasis on multiplayer gameplay, coupled with the accessibility, it made this game far more attractive to a broader audience, and it ended up facilitating a thriving and active player base that still is holding over 60k concurrent players on Steam even to this day. The commercial success of Monster Hunter World is undeniable. It's Capcom's fastest and best-selling game of all time. Won all kinds of awards and accolades, and on top of that, it sold over 20 million copies, which is crazy, but that's just because they just kept iterating and making the game better, and we're still going to talk a little bit on that. But when you have the ability to just put out a tweet and a headline saying return to world and start an event and 160,000 concurrent players show up to go play the game on Steam, man, that is crazy, especially when it's an over six-year-old game by this point. But Monster Hunter World showed players what Monster Hunter could be. And I think one of the reasons why Capcom saw so much immediate success and ongoing success with Monster Hunter World was because of the massive technological advancements that they had made to enhance the game and attract that broader audience in the first place. One of the most significant technological advancements or technological leaps came with Monster Hunter World's bold decision to transition away from portable devices and focus on the current generation consoles of the time. When we go back and we compare Monster Hunter XX or Monster Hunter Generations, which only released one to three years prior respectively, the leap in fidelity isn't gradual, it's monumental. These games look nothing alike. Monster Hunter World looked and felt decades ahead of its predecessors, boasting stunning visuals that still hold up even in today's standards. I think something else that's really important is the advancements in AI technology at the time, which played a pivotal role in popularizing the game. The monsters in the game exhibited more complex behaviors and interactions, creating a more dynamic and immersive experience. It felt like you were in an ecosystem at times. These creatures were no longer targets to be slain. They had their own routines, territories, and interactions with other wildlife, making hunts feel more organic and unpredictable. Is that what I think it is? That's not the... The AI evolution not only enhanced the game's realism, but introduced a new layer of strategy where massive monsters would start engaging in these territory battles, either causing chaos on the battlefield or providing unexpected advantages to us in combat, sometimes weakening them for us to be able to trap them. Capcom then continued to build on the success of Monster Hunter World by offering post-launch updates and expansions, such as Monster Hunter World Iceborne, introducing new content, improved performance, and adding features based on players' feedback. This commitment to ongoing development and support helped maintain the game's relevance and popularity far after its release. The impact of that continuous support and quality and the just a general quality of Monster Hunter World is still felt today, and I think it's starting to hit a boiling point. I feel like this is one of those moments where I get to talk about how video game companies need to do a better job of taking risks, because if we look at the history of Capcom and we look at the history of the Monster Hunter franchise, them taking the risk to put that much weight, that much money behind a title that wasn't on a portable device 
was a major gamble for them because that's where they've always been the most well established. Not saying that they haven't made games for consoles in the past, but most of their success have been on portable. So this is a huge deal for them to do something like this. And it paid off, paid off huge, bigger than any game they'd ever sold before and still have to this day. And that says a lot. But with that said, we look back to just recently how I had talked about the, the Return to World event. The game is now fresh in everybody's mind, but I feel like it's always been fresh in everybody's mind. If you've played Monster Hunter World, you're always looking forward to that next Monster Hunter experience. And that started a catalyst. Monster Hunter World is the catalyst for the massive success that I think the games are going to see in the coming years, and it's already starting to show. I think a lot of people underestimate the impact of Monster Hunter World on the Monster Hunter brand. Player perception and the popularity of the franchise has shifted to the point where we've seen player numbers exponentially increase in minor Monster Hunter releases post Monster Hunter World. And seeing as the Wilds is the direct sequel to World, that impact cannot be underestimated. With World's release, Capcom made a significant shift towards making the game live up to the identity of the title, breathing life into the world and its creatures, while at the exact same time streamlining some of that gameplay, removing barriers, and making the game more accessible, but more importantly, more enticing to a wider audience. When I think back to the release of World, it was genuinely the next generation game for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. It played the best, looked the best, it was filled with content, and it felt like a steal at full price. I'll be honest, I had tried Monster Hunter games in the past on the PSP and 3DS, but I bounced off of them because I felt like they lacked too much context. They felt linear in their design and they just didn't really look all that appealing. Monster Hunter World bridged that gap for me. It helped me understand the game and make my first steps into the franchise and I fell in love with it, finally understanding why people had loved these games for so long leading me to look at the rest of the games in a new light and play some of them as a result. And I'm not the only one, by the way. Looking at some of the rough sales figures for the games leading up to Monster Hunter World and then after, we can see an exponential shift in sales and wider adoption. Monster Hunter Stories in 2016 couldn't find its footing. However, Stories 2 released three years after World and it saw six times the amount of sales of the first game. Monster Hunter Rise acting as an adjacent portable edition managed to capture more than half of the sales of Monster Hunter World, showing just how much interest had increased in the brand over time. Now, you're sitting there asking yourself at this point in the video, is this guy really making a video about how Monster Hunter World is the reason why Wilds is going to do so well? Yes and no. See, Monster Hunter World is a lot of people's first introduction into Monster Hunter. And with that popularity and how much staying power that game has had over the years, it's definitely going to increase the reach of that game. And seeing as though Monster Hunter Wilds is the direct sequel to World, well, a lot of people are gonna to return to that point of sale. They're gonna to return to go buy that game again because they enjoyed it so much the first time around. When you have a game that was that popular that did that well, chances are people are gonna come back and give it another try when they see the direct sequel to that game come out. And while I think that Monster Hunter World is going to have an impact on the reach of the game, it's not the reason why the game is going to be incredibly successful. Actually, that has to do with some really unique circumstances that Monster Hunter Wilds is in, as well as what the game is bringing to the table. Way back in February of 2024, Sven Vinka, the head of Larian Studios and the renowned Baldur's Gate 3, put out a tweet on the discourse that was surrounding console refreshes and new consoles that could be coming in the future, and about how he doesn't feel like we've had the game that defines the generation. Many, including myself, would point to Baldur's Gate 3 or Elden Ring being that game. However, it still doesn't feel like we've had enough generation-defining titles for as long as we've been in this current generation of gaming. Monster Hunter Wilds is now on a hill of anticipation that has grown ever steeper throughout this entire generation. And as seeing as that Grand Theft Auto 6 is the only other major release in 2025, those games appeal to different audiences, some of that intersects, but not all of it, it's likely going to be a major catalyst for the game to reach incredible success. If you've watched the trailers, the game looks absolutely gorgeous, a step above many of the games released in recent memory. The environments display an insane amount of detail and reactivity. There's a moment in the trailer where you see the hunter slinger a rock from the ground, shoot it in an overhanging rock formation. It causes a monster to fall over and the rest of the herd to get stuck behind it. That is some crazy reactivity. The updated character models and clothing look insane, the monster designs are sick, the animations look fluid. Literally everything about the gameplay trailer screams next generation. 
Well, outside of the uncannily still character faces and dialogue, though, to be honest with you, this tells me that they're more focused on the gameplay than animating things that we're going to forget about in two seconds. You watch the trailer, and you want to play the game. In a developer blog on PlayStation.com, Capcom went into greater detail explaining more about what we saw in the trailer. One of the most notable additions to Wilds is the seamless integration of a living world where monsters, locales, and characters operate independently, creating this seamless open world, or at least it seems like an open world, and a more immersive ecosystem than we saw in Monster Hunter World. Players can embark on quests the moment they encounter a large creature, rather than having to pull something off of a hunt board. AI and monster behaviors have also been enhanced, making the world feel even more lifelike. Monsters are now going to exhibit complex behaviors rather than simply walking on set paths. Monsters are going to form herds and adapt to environmental changes. Oh yeah, environmental changes. Now we're going to have real-time weather, sandstorms, thunderstorms, and even more. Focus mode is a major addition that's going to allow for more precise control over guarding, attacking, and aiming. This new feature is going to ensure that we're going to be able to attack monsters' weak points more effectively, position ourselves more freely, and making the game easier for newcomers while also at the exact same time adding unique features and moves to focus mode to add more depth to combat for the veteran players. The most welcome change, and arguably the biggest change of all, is that we're going to be given the ability to stash a secondary weapon. Any of the existing weapons, including the same weapon that you already have on your mount, the secrets. Available to be able to pull out at any time, meaning that we are going to have access to the most dynamic hunting experience that we've ever had. Flying enemies are annoying, too difficult to take down with a greatsword, pull out a ranged weapon, bring them down, switch back, and then go at it. Enemy switches elements, or you encounter an enemy that is resistant to your type of damage, switch your weapons out. Literally everything on display here is enough to bring newcomers in and keep veteran players interested. And honestly, the same could be said for every single change that they're planning on making in Monster Hunter Wilds, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about all of this, is that Many studios and publishers will come out and say that they want to try to make their games appeal to a wider audience. And more times than not, that modern audience that they're trying to target, well, most of the changes that they make don't appeal to the people that have been veterans of these franchises for years now. I think World of Warcraft is probably the best example of this. But every single change that Monster Hunter and Capcom is making is something that I think both newcomers and existing players are going to be able to enjoy. I mean, sitting back and thinking about it right now, when I'm seeing that you're going to have the ability to have access to two weapons at once, I am trying to imagine the kind of tech that veteran players are going to be able to pull off with this kind of stuff. It's going to be crazy. But you need to be able to do things like that. You need to be able to have the foresight to understand that you want to try to do your best to appease the veteran players that have gotten you to where you are now. But at the exact same time, you want to do things that are going to be a benefit for them, while also a something that will attract players in that haven't played your game before. You have to find that sweet balance, and you have to make sure that it's appealing to both player bases, not just one. I honestly cannot believe I'm saying this in 2024, but one of the most significant improvements for Monster Hunter Wilds over its predecessors, including Monster Hunter World, is its commitment to being available on multiple platforms day one. Even Monster Hunter World had a staggered release on PC. By launching simultaneously on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC, Capcom is ensuring that they can capture the widest audience, the biggest audience they can, day one. That immediate access across different platforms and systems maximizes their player base from the outset. That's something that far too many games have had an issue with. We combine the fact that the game is also going to be fully cross-platform to play, and now we have a game that everyone can play and play together. Seriously, how do publishers and studios not realize how much money they stand to lose by not doing this? With that said, there is one key hidden catalyst that turns all of Capcom's hard work into one of the most dangerous releases in recent years. Capcom has no natural competition. It's not your standard RPG, it's not a Souls-like, an FPS, or a Battle Royale, it's Monster Hunter. Wild Hearts was a promising title, but it fell on its face due to performance issues. Dauntless had a strong start, but struggled to main any consistent player numbers, and God Eater is a series that I think is kind of cool, but it just doesn't scratch the same kind of itch. Monster Hunter occupies this very unique niche in the wider gaming landscape, blending together intricate combat mechanics and deep role-playing elements with a focus on cooperative multiplayer with live service elements, but not going fully live service. It still feels like a game that you own rather than a game that you're paying monthly for. There has been a growing hunger for games like this. 
games that step away from the competitive elements, the live service elements, and bring players together. Something that I think is well illustrated by the recent success of Helldivers 2. While other games might offer elements of this formula, none of them do it with the level of polish, depth, and dedication that Monster Hunter brings to the table. When we look at this from a bird's eye view, from a bird's eye perspective, we break it down to its individual elements and we look to see exactly what kind of behemoth Capcom is putting together with Monster Hunter Wilds, but it all starts to make sense because this game is going to be absolutely massive. It's building on the foundations that the game has laid before it, but on top of that, there's a, a palpable anticipation leading up to this game. A lot of people are looking forward to it. They're looking forward to playing that next iteration of Monster Hunter World, but even more so, the fact that they're releasing this game multi-platform day one with cross-platform capability day one is huge. I'm so sick and tired of hearing all of these different publishers and studios crying about how they're not making enough money when they're the ones that have been limiting themselves from being able to make that money in the first place. Let me paint you a picture really quick. I play Monster Hunter Wilds, or I watch somebody play Monster Hunter Wilds, and I go, that game looks cool. I tell somebody that that game looks cool. I go and play it and say that it's cool. But that I can only play it if I have access to play it in the first place. If I got a buddy of mine and he only plays on PlayStation or he only plays on Xbox, but then we can't play together, then we have one less reason to play that game together. I'm just sick and tired of these self-inflicted wounds that these companies have been crying about, and when you see a game that's now going to do all the things that they need to do to be able to make sure that game is a success, well, guess what? We're going to see it be successful. And that's exactly what's going to happen with Monster Hunter Wilds. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to this game so much. I'm going to live in this game. It's going to be so great. And I realize that there's probably some people that are out there that are probably a little concerned about the uh, performance issues that were with Dragon's Dogma 2 and a few other headaches with Dragon's Dogma 2. Now, mind you, some of that stuff might exist in Monster Hunter Wilds when it releases, but I do think that the general quality and performance is probably going to be much higher because this is their golden goose. You don't, you don't put chains on the golden goose. At least I hope they don't. But yeah, either way. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of a history lesson and Maybe some crackpot theories in some eyes, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to talk more about it. Can't wait for more information on it. And when there is more information, you'll hear about it here. Anyway, stay cool, stay righteous, stay safe, my friends. And I will see you in the next video. Peace. Family, 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 family.